what's going to happen. So I am Victoria. I'm an emergency physician. I work in Johannesburg. Simon actually asked me to talk about emergency medicine in South Africa, but I've only got 20 minutes. So it's just going to be much easier just to talk about my home city, which is Joburg. So I want to ask you, first of all, when did you fall in love with emergency medicine? Was it a particular shift or a particular day? Or was it over a particular patient that you were managing that ignited your passion in emergency medicine? I remember it very clearly. It was a particular shift when I was in my second year of being a doctor. I did my internship at Baraguanath Hospital. Um, you may know it. It's the third largest hospital in the world. And it is a huge hospital that has 3,000 beds. It serves a population of 4 million. And this is a very poor population. It has a huge trauma unit. And that's actually where I started. I was fresh out of medical school. This is the old trauma recess bay. Uh, you may have visited it subsequently. It's much better than this. But this is back in 2007. Um, it was about a 10-minute walk away from theater, CT scan, the blood bank. So the interns, which was us, were left to manage that by ourselves while our registrars were operating and the consultants were at home. That's what happened in 2007. So luckily, we could call our registrars to come help us with very serious cases, but that would be a five or 10 minute walk, depending on how quickly they got there. So we were dealing with gunshot wounds, stab wounds. We were dealing with critically injured polytrauma patients. And you can imagine that the learning curve was exceptionally steep. It was exhilarating, it was exciting. However, I must say that South Africa has this reputation for doing a lot of trauma, and sometimes I feel that we have to be honest and say that we don't always do it well. There's a difference between seeing a lot of trauma, and yes, we can manage a lot, but often really important, humane things can be left out. So back in 2007, there was no emergency medicine, and back then, we had no triage. So the old pit was a long corridor outside the trauma recess bay, and the patients were on stretches, and often those stretches snaked out the door. So from time to time, to make sure that no one was dying, we would go from one stretcher to another, saying, sorry, have you been shot? Have you been stabbed, or have you been in an accident? And we would just double-check the patient, you know, injuries above the knee would go into recess if we had space. But that was our triage. You can imagine that was not ideal. We didn't even know about procedural sedation. Um, analgesia was often forgotten in the madness and the mayhem of treating the important injuries. And also, we had no point of care ultrasound. So the way that we used to diagnose a stab heart if the patient was hemodynamically stable is we used to put in a central line and measure the central venous pressure. And if it was 18, 19, 20, we'd be like, hmm, this could actually be the sign of pericardial fluid in, in the pericardial sac. So I put in a lot of subclavian central lines as a result of that. But you can imagine how invasive and how unnecessary, and that is so different today because we have echo at our disposal. If you want to get a sense of what I'm talking about, I suggest you watch this documentary. It's called uh, Saving Soweto. It's a documentary that was filmed in 2009. I was still working at Baratrauma at the time. And I actually only watched it a few years later when I was actually working in a private hospital in Johannesburg. We have two different systems in, in South Africa. Private is like first world care only 20% of the population can afford it, while 80% has to go to state. 
So I was working in this fancy hospital. I had become desensitized, and I had forgotten, in a way, what I used to manage at Barra. And to be honest, I actually cried when I watched this because I remembered how much our patients suffered and how under-resourced we were. We were working exceptionally hard, but we just didn't have enough staff and resources to be able to keep up. So after Barrett trauma, uh, I was then moved to medicine for internal medicine rotation. And it was exceptionally different from trauma where often you were able to salvage patients because you know, with the right treatment, they were able to get better. But this was the time that AIDS-related deaths in South Africa were actually at their worst. You may remember this, that South Africa only initiated antiretrovirals in 2004. This was 10 years too late, and a million people died. So during this time, uh, when I was an intern, often you would be doing a night shift, and the nurses wouldn't call you for a resuscitation because they felt it was too futile. So you would go down these long corridors at Barra, and you would go from ward to ward, certifying uh, patients as dead. And it was always heartbreaking for me when I signed a death certificate. That was 1982, because that is my date of birth. And I thought to myself, like, how different would my life be if I was born in a different family? And as a result, and I strongly feel this, that that experience in internal medicine is what drove me to emergency medicine. So this is true that in South Africa at the time, you were either affected or infected with HIV AIDS. So in my second year, it was a time that we rotated through family medicine, and I was rotating through a small hospital that had a casualty. It was a true casualty back then. There were only general practitioners, and it was actually in this very simple hospital that I discovered my love for emergency medicine. I remember the day where a rush of patients came and I did an RSI on a patient with a severe head injury. Then a young woman comes in with hemorrhagic shock from an incomplete abortion, so I resuscitated Sorry, and then a young baby comes in with pneumonia with severe dehydration, so I treated the baby. And it was at that point that I realized that I loved the pace, the unpredictability, but most importantly, in emergency medicine, I felt that we could make a difference. So it was the following year, I, I'm a, a definitely a seeker of punishment, so I went back for more of barotrauma, another six months, and I was seeing another patient with a stab to the chest. We weren't sure if this was a stab to the heart, so we were going to take him for a sub-xiphoid window. Um, and I came across Dr. Laura Goldstein, who is the very first emergency physician to graduate out of Joburg. And I told her about the case, and she was like, of course, I'll do an echo for you. Back then, the cardiologists were too busy to help us, and they very often would not come out at night. So she ended up doing an echo, and it was obvious. What was not obvious on clinical exam was clearly obvious on echo. Patient had a clot in the pericardial sac. There was echocardiographic evidence of tamponade, and the patient ended up having a stenotomy. We knew exactly what to do, and the patient did fine. So in South Africa, emergency medicine became a recognized speciality in 2003. The first EM physician graduated in 2007 from Cape Town. Lara graduated in 2009. And now in 2018, we have 125 emergency physicians. Not everyone practices in the country, some have immigrated. So we have about 100 emergency physicians for 54 million people. So we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, in South Africa, you spend four years specializing as a registrar. 
And I remember my reg time being quite lonely because our consultants were often not on the floor. They were the pioneers, which sounds exciting, but really it was being in boardrooms, it was buying equipment, organizing timetables, writing policies and protocols, so they were often not on the floor to help us. So we did a lot of self-learning, and this is also when I actually discovered Twitter and came into contact with a lot of emergency medicine physicians around the world. And it made a huge difference to me, definitely in terms of mentorship and knowing that other emergency physicians were out there. I sometimes reached out to them for advice, and it really inspired me and had a difference on my practice. So today, this is my hospital. Uh, it's Tele Mokharane Hospital. Tele Mokharane was an apartheid activist who came from this area, and he was executed during the apartheid regime. So the hospital is named after him, and his brother interviewed me for my job. So history in South Africa is still very much alive and with us. This is my recess bay. It has four beds. It's meant to be a four-bedded recess. It actually is very well equipped. I have excellent ventilators. I've got CMAC video laryngoscopy. Um, I've got a Lucas. I think I'm the only ED in the country that has a Lucas. And I even have a TEG. So if anyone wants to come and do research, please just come talk to me, because I don't have time, unfortunately, to do research and to use my TEG. But this is the actual reality of the situation, and that is, we are often f full and flowing. I have two nurses for nine beds, because we often are overflowing in recess. And I generally have about four or five doctors for the whole emergency department. Um, my emergency department does not see any minors whatsoever. They actually get managed by family medicine. So we only have the critically ill and the critically injured to manage. This is often a case that our ICUs are too full, so we end up looking after our ICU patients, um, sometimes up to days. This was a patient who had a severe calcium channel blocker overdose, so he was on maximum adrenaline. He was on uh, eight units per kilogram per hour of insulin, short-acting insulin for his calcium channel blocker. We had given him intralipid, and he was also on maximum ARDS net uh, in terms of his ventilation because he had such severe pulmonary edema. And he was so unstable, we actually decided to keep him in our unit. And we were standing around his bed, and I was telling everyone, you know what? Um, overseas, in France, they can do ECMO, even in museums. And this would be a great candidate for ECMO because he's salvageable, we are actually at the max of therapy, but we don't have ECMO in terms of pre-hospital in South Africa. There's only one other hospital, and he was actually too sick to be transferred. But he actually did pretty well. Um, the next day, his ECG had normalized. His GCS was actually 15 out of 15, but we kept him ventilated because he still had severe edema. But it was nice to just share with my MOs uh, what the possibilities are. And yes, we don't have ECMO, but I feel very proud of the fact that we actually salvaged this patient to the point that he got to ICU and did fairly well. So South Africa has a lot of contrasts. This is an, um, from a drone, which clearly shows that you have a lot of middle-class people who have nice houses, I've heard a quote to say that South Africa has more swimming pools uh, outside of California, which is quite crazy, but it, apparently it's true. And the rest of South Africa is exceptionally poor and still lives in shanty towns without electricity and water. So as a result, um, we see a quadruple burden of disease in our emergency departments. So we see HIV and communicable diseases. We see a lot of trauma. 
and we also see a rising epidemic of non-communicable diseases. And I'm just going to show you in the last 10 years how South Africa has changed. So in 2005, we had just received antiretrovirals. You can see that a lot of the causes of death are due to communicable diseases related to HIV. Ten years later, our HIV epidemic is actually getting under control. We're not having young people die unnecessarily from HIV as much as we used to. And now what we're finding is that the, the non-communicable diseases, the diseases of lifestyle, are actually taking um, effect. So diabetes is the second cause of death in South Africa. I'm sure none of you suspected that. And this is what we have. So the communicable diseases and even our trauma epidemic is improving. Patients are dying less from those, but more patients are dying from diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and strokes. So in South Africa, we realize that as emergency physicians, we need to actually keep pace with our uh, patients, what their diseases are, and this is the real challenge that we need to keep up with. Back in the 90s, it was okay to just know trauma, but now we need to know trauma, HIV, hypertension, diabetes. A lot of uh, people who come to visit me from other countries are often surprised at the amount of Western diseases that we manage in my ED. So if you ever come to South Africa, please don't leave your European knowledge at home. You need to bring it with you because you're going to see patients like that. If you ever follow me on, on Twitter, you will know I am a strong proponent of gun control. And the reason is, is that it actually had a very good effect in my country. In 1994, that was the year that we became a democratic country, the murder rate was 69.9. It was horrendous. It didn't improve much until the year 2000, it was at 67, until we introduced the Firearms Act, which made guns very difficult to purchase, the licenses, and a lot of illegal guns were surrendered. Within a 10-year period, our murder rate halved. We actually see less gunshot wounds than the US. We see mainly stab wounds, so our criminals have had to resort to knives rather than guns because they're, more, they're harder to get to. And even our forensic studies have actually proven this, that the gun control has really helped in our country. You will notice that there's been a tapering off over the last couple of years, and that is because there have been some corrupt policemen who've been recently caught, but they had actually stolen a lot of weapons that were um, kind of uh, kept in a protected uh, compound, and they were selling them back to the gangs. So unfortunately, that has resulted in the murder rate, especially in Cape Town, it's actually kind of gone up again. So it just shows you that you just not only need law, but you need you know, the police and actually uh, prevention of corruption to continue it. In terms of our diseases, yes, we do see a lot of HIV and TB, but it can manifest in ways that are different. So this is a deep vein thrombosis on ultrasound, and our risk factors for deep vein thrombosis are not cancer or immobility, it's HIV and TB. So how do we do a well score then? for DVT. We almost need our own well score, and uh, this is why research is so important in our population. We also see a lot of HIV-related uh, acute coronary syndromes because HIV causes vasculitis. So it's not uncommon to see a 28-year-old black female uh, with a STEMI. So it just means that your traditional risk factors are not our traditional risk factors. Yes, we do need to know that, but we also need to know how diseases manifest in our own patients. Our overdoses are also very different. We see a lot of isoniazid overdoses because TB treatment is very common. Calcium channel blocker overdoses are common as well because it's our 
antihypertensive that we prescribe the most. It's the most effective in our black patients. We still use a lot of tricyclic antidepressants because our patients have a lot of neuropathic pain from HIV and diabetes. But the overdose that I see the most is a poisoning from organophosphates. And this is a nearly daily experience in my ED where we just sit there and we just crack amps of atropine because our organophosphate poisonings come in with severe cholinergic syndrome. And this was a recent patient who needed a thousand amps of atropine um, because he needed a 512 milligram bolus in order to dry up his chest. That was the final point that we could actually start um, continuing the protocol. So I've discovered as an emergency physician, it's not just the clinical stuff. I've had to look at this extreme waste of time and actually source 100 milligram vials from Germany and get them imported to South Africa so that we don't have to spend our time cracking atropine amps, which is often a daily occurrence. So hopefully I'm gonna have those vials very soon. I'm tempted to actually take them with me, but I have to go through my medical control council. So I just wanna say wam kili kili. It means we welcome you. Um, some of you have come to South Africa as medical students. Uh, Robert speaks about being terrified, but I can't tell you how much you are a help to us. We are severely under-resourced and we are more than willing to help you and teach you as you also help us exceptionally. Um, I found that the students, especially from Germany and Austria, have been incredibly hardworking and respectful to our patients, and we really appreciate that. So, yeah, unfortunately, we can't pay you. We have no money uh, for posts, but please come over and come and work with us. You're absolutely welcome. So this is Bad EM. This is Brave African Discussions in Emergency Medicine. You can check it out. It's a website that has been started by a group of us. And yeah, uh, thank you so much for your attention.